Good morning, everyone. My name is Isabel Daniel. I'm serving as the uh, EMU Acting President, and it is my pleasure today to host uh, the EMU uh, Medal Lecture. So the Medal uh, Lecture will be given today by the recipient of the 2022 Research Excellence uh, Award of the European Mineralogical Union. His name is uh, Dr. Jakub Kjertsak from uh, the University of uh, Drafo, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, in, in Poland. Uh, before uh, we move on, I would like to mention to all the attendees that the presentation is uh, uh, recorded. And I will also kindly ask the, att the, at the attendees to turn their mic off, please. So, as an introduction, so I'd like to say that Dr. Kjertsak is internationally uh, renowned for his work on the mobility and distribution of uh, metals in natural and anthropogenic soils, uh, as well as for his achievements in studying metallurgical slags with a multidisciplinary approach of uh, environmental, archaeological, and metal recovery uh, uh, research. Um, is uh, one of his uh, main uh, uh, concern is of course related to this the environmental impact of uh, ultra for these uh, ultramafic sites, uh, because he's, he's, he's always stressed uh, that nickel, chromium, and cobalt are easily mobi mobilized and may pose uh, some uh, else uh, issues. And in particular, is shown uh, the importance of. Uh, uh, minerals uh, uh, in uh, soils and metallurgical slides for the prediction of the metal mobility for these uh, materials. He's a very active uh, researcher, as I said. He's also deeply committed to the mineralogical uh, communities uh, at the European level. He has uh, established uh, an intensive network of uh, collaborations with scientists from uh, several institutions in, uh, in Europe. He has uh, a European training as well. And he is deeply involved into the integration of uh, the mineral community in Poland, where he has taken uh, the, the, the presidency of the Mineralogical Society of uh, Poland since uh, December uh, 2020. In short, uh, Dr. Jakub Kjertsak, his interdisciplinary approach, combined with his dedication to advancing scientific knowledge, makes him a deserving recipient of the European Mineralogical Union Research Excellence Medal uh, in 2022. Before I leave you the screen, I would just like to show you, to show you and the audience the medal that you will be uh, receiving, uh, I guess, in uh, this summer at the AMC conference in, in Dublin. So it has one face with the EMU uh, a logo and a crystal. And on the other side, it has your, it's it's shining, but you have your, your name here. So with that, uh, dear Jakub, uh, I, I leave you the, the screen. And please, attendees, switch off your, turn off your mic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, first of all, thank you, Isabel, very much for your kind introduction. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to express my thanks to the medal committee for this great honor and for um, awarding me the uh, European Mineralogical Union uh, medal. Uh, I will just uh, yeah, do this, this, not to be... Uh, okay, so uh, for today's talk, I choose not the metallurgical slugs, uh, the topic I'm mostly involved in, but uh, some kind of my hobby, I mean, ultramafic geoecosystems. Uh, and uh, of course, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present some of my scientific activities uh, in front of such a wide uh, audience. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you uh, some uh, results of my research on the ultramafic geosystems, as I already told, and I will mostly focus on metallic elements distribution and mobility uh, 
Uh, but uh, my ultimate goal, uh, the ultimate goal of my presentation is to convince you that uh, uh, the study of ultramafic geosystems can be interesting and uh, that there is still much to discover in this uh, topic. Uh, okay, so let me first present the outline of my presentation. I will start with some general information about ultramafic rocks and soils. Uh, next, I will show you that these materials uh, really represent a natural source of uh, metallic elements to the environment. Uh, next, uh, I will try to answer the question of uh, whether and how the type of ultramafic parent rock affect the mobility of uh, metallic elements in soil. And to the last part, in the last part of my talk today, I will address the topic of the behavior of metallic elements during the process of uh, mineral carbonation of ultramafic uh, rocks. Uh, so before um, I will go uh, into the details, let me uh, start with a few facts about ultramafic geosystems and especially uh, what are the characteristics uh, uh, that uh, make these uh, geosystems uh, special or peculiar? Uh, so the ultramafic rocks and associated soils are uh, characterized by, by high magnesium and at the same time low calcium concentrations. Uh, soils uh, have uh, low nitrogen and phosphorus contents, uh, but both soils and rocks have uh, elevated concentrations of metallic elements such as uh, nickel, chromium, and cobalt. Uh, the soils uh, formed on, to, on um, uh, ultramafic parent rock harbor a distinct and often endemic plant community. And these two photos that you can see uh, are uh, European ultramafic uh, landscapes. The photo on the left shows ultramafic soils in the Massif Central uh, in France. Uh, uh, on the right side, we can see a char characteristic fern uh, that grows on serpentine rocks uh, in uh, Poland. In the simplest terms, uh, ultramafic rocks uh, are dark, uh, and uh, quite rare within uh, continental crust and on the Earth's surface. A more complex approach is that uh, two types of uh, ultramafic rocks uh, dominate. Uh, these uh, are uh, igneous peridotite, uh, a plutonic rock, and its uh, metamorphic equivalent uh, serpentinite. Both of these uh, rocks uh, represent, represent uh, remnants of uh, oceanic crust incorporated uh, into the continental crust during uh, large-scale tectonic movements. Uh, however, the realm of uh, ultramafic rocks is more diverse, and uh, to understand uh, the weathering of these rocks, uh, uh, a closer look uh, at the mineralogy and uh, chemical composition is uh, needed. Uh, and uh, uh, ultramafic rocks are composed uh, mostly of uh, four major mafic minerals that are the base uh, of uh, the ultramafic rock classifications and this uh, classification triangles you can see on this um, picture. And these minerals are uh, olivine, uh, orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, and hornblende. Uh, ultramafic uh, rocks uh, are uh, often metamorphosed and uh, form and serpentinized are formed. Uh, this process is called serpentinization and uh, is the most uh, pervasive at uh, ocean floors, uh, what is where where this process is controlled by uh, reactions of uh, ultra parent ultramafic rock uh, with uh, circulating uh, seawater at uh, temperatures uh, generally below. 400 degrees. Uh, and uh, in reality, uh, pure serpentinites uh, are uh, or pure uh, igneous uh, ultramafic rocks uh, occur less frequently than uh, partially serpentinized rocks uh, during uh, the metamorphic uh, processes. Uh, uh, volatiles and uh, fluid mobile elements such as water, uh, carbon dioxide, or hydrogen sulfide 
uh, are added to the system, but uh, it does not change very much the uh, chemical composition of the rock. Uh, but uh, the mineral composition is partially or fully transformed to a more stable one. And uh, during metamorphism, uh, num numerous reactions uh, can take place, uh, depending on the temperature, but the predominant metamorphic uh, phases are serpentine group minerals uh, and uh, other important but uh, may, minor or, or accessory phases are magnetite, uh, talc, or brucite, and uh, magnesite. So these are the main components of uh, serpentinites uh, or serpentinite uh, peridotite. Uh, so as you can see, uh, ultramafic rocks uh, can be uh, quite uh, diverse in terms of mineralogy. Uh, and uh, it's uh, always um, important to take a close, uh, closer look at uh, these rocks uh, and determine uh, what are the main uh, carriers of uh, nickel, chromium and uh, cobalt. Cobalt, uh, the elements uh, whose mobility is usually studied in ultramafic soils, in ultramafic uh, geosystem. And uh, this illustration shows the concentrations of nickel, chromium, uh, nickel and chromium in uh, various minerals and uh, in bulk uh, composition of uh, ultramafic rocks. Uh, and we see that uh, olivine um, is uh, um, a major nickel bearing phase and uh, pyroxene is a major chromium bearing phase. Uh, spinel group minerals uh, can be a uh, few order, even few order of uh, magnitude richer in uh, chromium than pyroxene. Uh, and uh, spinels have similar uh, nickel concentrations uh, uh, to olivine, but uh, it's not, uh, these, these phases are not as abundant and uh, especially not in uh, pyroxenites. A chromium content in the whole rock uh, chemical composition for the majority of uh, ultramafic rocks uh, plots uh, in between the composition of olivines, uh, pyroxenes, and uh, chromium rich spinels. Uh, and during uh, serpentinization, nickel and chromium transfer to older phases. And uh, uh, we can see that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you see the pointer? <laughs> I hope. Yeah, so during serpentinization, nickel yes, uh, Jacob, and, we see and it. chromium uh, are transferred to other phases and uh, uh, serpentine uh, formed uh, after orthopyroxene uh, are, uh, I mean, uh, bastite uh, uh, texture here. You can see the... the diamonds uh, here, uh, has uh, different chromium and nickel uh, concentrations than uh, serpentinite form after olivine, uh, uh, indicated here in, uh, as a mesh texture. Uh, in fact, uh, both types of uh, serpent serpentine group minerals closely mimic the composition of the primary minerals, uh, I mean olivine and uh, uh, orthopyroxene. Uh, so you can see this on this uh, bottom left picture. Uh, however, as serpentinization uh, progresses, a common composition of uh, serpentine uh, group minerals uh, forms with an average uh, nickel and chromium contents uh, between uh, these uh, of olivine and those of uh, pyroxene. And you can see this on this uh, um, right uh, bottom um, picture. Uh, so the most uh, okay. So so the most important information about the metal uh, content of ultramafic rock is that uh, regardless of the diversity due to genesis or mineral composition. All these rocks contain elevated concentrations of nickel, chromium, and uh, cobalt. Uh, and uh, no matter what is the parent rock, uh, serpentinite, peridotite, or pyroxenite, 
All soils uh, de derived from ultramafic rocks are jointly referred to, to as ultramafic soils, and this is because uh, similar vegetation cover occurs uh, uh, on all types of uh, of these rocks. Uh, and uh, these soils are, in are interesting object of study because they offer um, the possibility of analyzing the mobility of metallic elements from natural sources. Uh, they uh, constitute a kind of hotspot for biodiversity and uh, uh, soil forming processes uh, occurring uh, in these soils are uh, slightly different from uh, those observed in uh, soils to, soils formed on other rocks uh, okay so uh, maybe just uh, to mention that uh, there are approximately 500 pla uh, plant species with uh, uh, hyper accumulating properties so these are the properties to transfer metallic elements from roots to uh, above ground parts of uh, of the plants and uh, about uh, 450 uh, for, of these uh, plant species are uh, that are nickel hyperaccumulators uh, occurring uh, uh, in ultramafic areas. So I will go to this. Uh, I will go. I will go back to this um, um, topic a little bit uh, later in my presentation. So the next uh, figure shows the total nickel and uh, chromium contents uh, concentrations uh, of uh, ultramafic soils worldwide. Uh, and uh, additionally, the diagram also shows uh, kind of limit values for the concentrations of these two metals in the surface layer of soil. These are uh, regulatory guidance values uh, um from the paper of Jennings uh, and this this is a median um, uh, RGV uh, for nickel and chromium and also uh, permissible limits of uh, nickel and chromium established by Polish law uh, and uh, we see that for almost all soils analyzed in approximately 50 uh, scientific papers, nickel and chromium contents uh, exceed uh, regulatory guidance values and uh, permissible limits, limits uh, established for um, arable, arable soils. Uh, and uh, uh, furthermore, uh, um, in quite of, uh, a few of uh, analyzed soils, uh, the permissible limits are also exceeded uh, for soils uh, of industrial uh, sites. And we also see that the median uh, content of nickel and uh, chromium in ultramafic soils uh, is an order of uh, magnitude higher than the limit value for these uh, two elements. Uh, okay, so what about cobalt? And uh, the next slide, um, where we uh, see the cobalt and nickel content uh, of uh, ultramafic soils from uh, again various locations uh, around the world, uh, and the situation is similar uh, when uh, it comes to the permissible uh, values uh, set by. Polish legislation and the uh, limit values defined as the median RGVs. Uh, in both cases, uh, the established limits are exceeded for almost uh, all uh, soils and uh, the median uh, value of cobalt uh, comparing um, to the regulatory uh, guidance values, we see that this median uh, content uh, of uh, ultramafic rocks uh, exceeds the RGV twice value, the value of RGV. Okay, so I think I convince you that uh, ultramafic soils are a natural source of um, metals for the environment. Uh, the high metal content uh, char characteristic for these uh, formations, for these soils and rocks, is not due to pollution, but uh, it's rather referred to as a peculiar geochemical background. 
so uh, there is no reason or even there is no not we do not have really a possibility to to remediation of uh, of this soil of of these soils uh, but uh, at the same time it's not easy to find uh, an ultra mafic soil uh, that doesn't which does not uh, overstep the limits for uh, permissible concentrations of nickel chromium and cobalt uh, but um, of course the high um, metal content uh, uh, high uh, concentrations of uh, potential contaminants in soil does not necessarily mean that uh, they pose a threat to uh, the environment. Uh, the key in this case uh, is to determine how mobile uh, the elements, uh, the, the potential contaminants uh, in ultramafic soils are. Uh, so now I would like to start the second part of my talk, with uh, which uh, will be focused on the mobility of uh, metallic elements in uh, ultramafic soils. Uh, yeah, so um, ultramafic soils, although referred uh, to uh, by uh, one name, uh, regardless of uh, what parent material material they formed of, uh, these soils can show some variability. And uh, this uh, diversity is uh, primarily due to uh, differences in the mineral composition of the parent rocks. Uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, iron, in uh, peridotites, uh, occurs mostly in olivine, whereas in serpentinite, uh, major iron bearing, uh, bearing phase is magnetite, uh, which is more resistant to weathering than uh, olivine. Uh, and that's why iron is more readily released uh, in soils developed from peridotites uh, than in those derived uh, from uh, serpentinites uh, producing higher concentrations of uh, iron oxy hydroxides in the soils on peridotites and uh, generally uh, it is also visible generally it's uh, there is an agreement that the soils on peridotites are more redder than soils uh, derived from serpentinites uh, and uh, this is what uh, this was the idea uh, for a research hypothesis uh, because um, since major components of uh, igneous ultramafic rocks, uh, I mean peridotites, uh, so the components like uh, olivine or pyroxene uh, are less resistant to weathering that, uh, than serpentine group minerals, uh, which are principal components of serpentinites. Uh, then uh, we expect that the mobility of metallic elements should be affected by the, by, uh, the type uh, of the ultramafic rock uh, and should depend, uh, this uh, uh, mobility should depend uh, on the degree of alteration of the primary peridotite or pyroxenite. Uh, so uh, let me briefly... Um, so this is basically the, the hypothesis or the, the research question, whether the type of uh, parent ultramafic rock affect the bioaccessibility of uh, metals in ultramafic soil. And uh, uh, right now, let me briefly outline the area of my research. Uh, so I will not go into the details about the geological settings, uh, but I uh, will only mention mm, that uh, in general there are only few places uh, uh, where the ultramafic rocks uh, crop out in Poland and uh, these uh, localities are limited to the southwestern part of <laughs> Poland. Um, ultramafic rocks uh, are mostly uh, associated with ophiolite structures uh, uh, but they also appear in the form of, of uh, small, small exposures. Uh, so I, for, for my, my study, for our study, uh, we choose six ultramafic size, sites uh, uh, and uh, rocks from these places uh, are, uh, of course, characterized by uh, considerable diversity 
uh, from uh, partially serpentinite peridotites uh, through peridotites with uh, relics of primary phases and textures and uh, to proper serpentinites uh, composed almost exclusively of the uh, serpentine group minerals without any relics of uh, primary phase phases or uh, textures. And yeah, these are the illustrations of uh, studied materials. Uh, uh, so you can see the, uh, the microscopic view of uh, of each ultramafic rock and uh, microscopic image. Uh, uh, and uh, what I would like you to do is to remember the color code for the serpentinites, uh, peridotite, peridotites, uh, it's red, uh, orange for serpentinites with uh, primary phases or textures, and green for proper serpentinite. Uh, and this color code will be used in discussing the rest of the results uh, concerning the mobility uh, of uh, metallic elements uh, and the relationship between um, type of apparent ultramafic rock and uh, metal uh, mobility. So what about the soil? The soils uh, developed uh, on the studied uh, ultramafics. Uh, are characterized by a similar uh, sequence of soil genetic horizons. Uh, however, they show some uh, differences in this uh, development highlighted by uh, diverse thickness of uh, subsoil horizon and uh, solemn thickness uh, above uh, continuous rock uh, varies uh, from 20 centimeters uh, up to uh, one meter, especially in site uh, four. Um, okay, so the next uh, step in our research was to determine the bioavailability of uh, these three uh, ultramafic elements. Sorry for this uh, for this uh, slide, uh, but uh, I just wanted to to show the most important thing about the the mobility, the extractability. Uh, and uh, for this purpose, we choose the single step um, extraction method uh, with uh, EDTA solution. Uh, so this uh, illustration uh, shows uh, um, the results obtained for all profiles and uh, it could be it might, might be difficult to read. Uh, but I would like to point out that the mobility of nickel is the highest, uh, whereas chromium is the least mobile element in for all studied uh, uh, soils. And uh, what is also important that uh, we did not see any relationship between type of the parent rock uh, and uh, chromium uh, extractability. Uh, but uh, let's check uh, what, uh, in the case of uh, nickel and cobalt, maybe uh, there are some relationships here. And uh, uh, what I have to mention before, that I will discuss the mobility uh, of uh, nickel and cobalt uh, only in, uh, in mineral horizons only, because uh, the impact of the bedrock on soil organic horizons is uh, negligible and uh, because uh, also of the differences in vegetation cover between uh, studied sites. Uh, so the, the lowest proportions of uh, EDTA extractable fractions uh, uh, of nickel, because we, we start with nickel, uh, are uh, are observed in uh, mineral horizons of soils derived from proper serpentinite, so the green ones. Uh, so it's up to uh, 7%. Uh, and the highest proportions of EDTA uh, extractable, uh, extractable uh, fractions of nickel are noted for soils uh, derived from uh, uh, serpentinized peridotites uh, and uh, hornblende peridotite from uh, site six and from and for uh, soils derived uh, from uh, peridotites or serpentinites uh, with relics of primary phases and textures. So we see that uh, it could be up to uh, 17 or 18 percent. 
And uh, for cobalt, mm, the lowest proportions of uh, EDTA uh, extractable fractions uh, are observed in soils uh, derived from proper serpentinite. So it's uh, up to 4% uh, of uh, total cobalt concentrations and the highest proportions of uh, EDTA extractable cobalt uh, are noted for soils derived from uh, partially serpentinized peridotite uh, and uh, for the, yeah, the, the first site here up to 60%, uh, 16%, sorry. Uh, and uh, can this be uh, somehow explained? Uh, in the case of nickel, it seems to be quite easy uh, to explain. In uh, peridotites, uh, olivine is the main uh, nickel bearing phase, uh, while in serpentinite, uh, these are uh, serpentine group minerals and uh, magnetite. Uh, as olivine, olivine uh, is less stable and weather more quickly in the soil uh, environment, uh, we could expect um, that the associated nickel will be more mobile in soils uh, than um, um, in will be more mobile in soils that are, are the, uh, which are formed on. Uh, serpentinized, partially serpentinized peridotites, uh, uh, which are characterized by a lower degree of uh, serpentinization. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go back to the question uh, asked at the beginning of uh, this uh, second part of, uh, of the presentation, and uh, we can try to answer it. Uh, so in the case of chromium, uh, we did not see a clear uh, relationship between uh, the mobility of uh, of chromium and the type of uh, rock on which uh, ultramafic uh, soils formed. Uh, and uh, but uh, this can be quite easily explained uh, because chromium bearing minerals are uh, similar for all ultramafic rocks, uh, and uh, all these phases are resistant to weathering. Uh, uh, but um, in the case of nickel and, uh, and cobalt, uh, the answer is yes, because we noted uh, higher mobility or higher uh, EDTA extractability of these two elements in uh, mineral horizons of soils formed on uh, serpentinized peridotites and uh, some serpentinites uh, with some relics of uh, primary phases or, or textures or pseudomorphic uh, textures and so we can uh, uh, we can also uh, try to answer and we can try to to explain why is that uh, so uh, nickel and chromium you know, were once mobilized during serpentinization and uh, these elements uh, when then trapped again by the phases more resistant to weathering uh, such as serpentine group minerals and magnetites uh, than uh, these uh, primary constituents co components of, uh, of ultramafic rocks, uh, mainly uh, olivine. Uh, and so we uh, are happy because so we we've managed to uh, at least partially uh, prove the research uh, hypothesis. Yeah, uh, but it's not that uh, simple as it looks like. <laughs> uh, so let's see what it looks like in relation to the real mobility of metallic elements and uh, real mobility. I mean. Uh, uh, the content of these uh, three metallic elements in plants growing on uh, studied uh, ultramafic uh, soils, not only on studied, but uh, ultramafic soils worldwide. Uh, and on these uh, diagrams, I'm showing uh, you a nickel, uh, chromium and uh, cobalt content in, in plants uh, growing in ultramafic areas. Uh, and uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, it's uh, 
that these plants are characterized or contain elevated uh, concentrations of uh, uh, these three elements. Uh, I'm not talking only about the plants hyperaccumulators. Uh, so these plants that contain more than 1000 uh, milligrams per kilo of uh, nickel, especially nickel. Um, but uh, as you can see, uh, even excluder or uh, on the right side, uh, edible plants uh, uh, can contain enough nickel to overstep uh, this uh, um, RGV, or regulatory guidance values, uh, design for uh, total contents in, uh, in soils. So uh, we can conclude that uh, based on the chemical analysis of plants, uh, a part of metallic elements, especially nickel, uh, can be considered as uh, mobile. Okay, so to further test uh, our research hypothesis, we began to analyze plants growing in uh, two previously uh, studied locations. For this study, we have uh, selected one soil developed uh, on serpentinized peridotites. Uh, so this was uh, site one from the previous uh, study. Uh, and uh, uh, the second uh, one was the pro was soil derived on proper serpentinite, uh, indicated in the previous uh, study as um, site four. Uh, but uh, both these locations were characterized by the presence of uh, similar vegetation covers, so we decided to analyze the plants and the soil uh, and just to compare uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, metallic element contents uh, in soil and in, in plants. Uh, so in... Uh, Additionally, uh, to with uh, EDTA extraction, we further uh, extracted both soils with uh, DTPA uh, solution. And based on these uh, extractions, we confirmed that soil derived from uh, this is uh, these are the results from uh, four soils uh, derived from serpentinized peridotite. Uh, so. <clears throat> We confirm that soil derived from uh, serpentinized peridotite is characterized by higher phyto uh, availability of nickel compared to soil derived from uh, proper serpentinite. Uh, and uh, uh, this figure, uh, we can also see that the, on this figure that the amount of nickel extracted by uh, EDTA and DTPA solutions uh, are. Uh, are generally uh, higher than nickel content in plants. So these are the nickel content measure in plants. And we see that uh, the extraction results are in line with a direct plant uh, analysis. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of plants growing in soil derived from the proper serpentinite, we noted that uh, the concentrations of nickel are uh, higher than those uh, theoretically estimated by extraction. So we see that for a lot of uh, plants, for a lot of uh, data, uh, we have much more uh, nickel uh, in plant that, uh, than uh, the value estimated by these two uh, extractions. Uh, so we also observe higher nickel concentrations in plants from this location. Uh, so it would seem that our research hypothesis was not confirmed. It was unexpected that uh, plants growing in the soil derived from uh, serpentinite uh, contain higher levels of metals uh, compared to those from the soil formed on serpentinized peridotite. And it was unexpected, uh, especially these, that uh, the values uh, measure in plants uh, uh, will be much uh, higher than those estimated by chemical extractions. And again, we tried uh, to explain this behavior and this uh, uh, contrasting behavior can be explained by uh, higher abundances of calcium and uh, magnesium in soil uh, derived from the serpentinized uh, peridot peridotite as compared to the values uh, uh, 
uh, measured uh, in soil derived from the serpentinite uh, because calcium and magnesium uh, are favored by plants and preferably uh, fill the available sites. And these results in lower nickel and uh, probably cobalt as well intake, uh, despite the higher abundances in uh, soil. Uh, so since the increased level levels of uh, calcium and magnesium in the soil on peridotite are directly re related to the properties of the parent rock, the increased amount of uh, magnesium comes from the weathering of olivine and uh, in this soil uh, derived on serpentinized peridotite, uh, the calcium carrier is amphibole tremolite, which uh, does not occur uh, in uh, serpentinite. So it can be concluded uh, that our research hypothesis was finally proven, and uh, we can answer yes to the question I uh, asked uh, at the beginning of the second part of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, so now we can move uh, to the third and uh, the last part of, uh, of my presentation, which will be focused on uh, mineral carbonation uh, and uh, what happens with metallic elements uh, during this process. We already saw that uh, metallic elements uh, could be mobile during weathering of ultramafic rocks and uh, soil formation processes. Uh, it would be uh, interesting to find out what is the fate of metallic elements during mineral carbonation of uh, ultramafic uh, rocks. Uh, and this process, of course, mineral carbonation is a process that uh, occurs in nature. Uh, it has, uh, but it, it uh, interests the, the research researchers because uh, it's one of the potential methods uh, that could be uh, used to bind uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, the process itself, itself uh, involves um, the binding of uh, carbon dioxide through mineral reactions, which uh, in the case of minerals characteristic of ultramafic rocks uh, looks uh, look like uh, the example presented here. And here are the simplest uh, reactions of uh, mineral carbonations, carbonation. And uh, uh, ultramafic rocks uh, appear to be perfect materials for mineral carbonation because uh, the minerals of uh, which they are composed uh, of react relatively easy with uh, carbon dioxide. And we have uh, plenty of examples of uh, mineral carbonation in nature. And as you can see on the pictures on the right side and uh, uh, in the one of the recent uh, uh, issue of the Elements magazine, there are plenty examples of uh, natural mineral carbonation. Uh, the, the title of this uh, issue was Olivine, if I remember well. So uh, now it's time to, to present the goals behind, behind uh, this uh, third part of, uh, of research uh, or the third part of this presentation. Uh, so we already know that ultramafic rocks uh, contain a relatively high uh, concentrations of some uh, metallic elements such as uh, nickel and chromium. Uh, we also know that uh, these materials are perfect substrates for uh, mineral carbonation, uh, but uh, what we don't know is uh, how these elements behave during the carbonation processes. And uh, this research problem we are trying uh, to solve now with, with my team. Uh, so I won't be able to answer this question during today's presentation, but I will try to show uh, what stage of uh, research uh, we are currently at. And I will try to leave you with some open questions uh, just to, to think a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so uh, for this study, we uh, choose three uh, rocks, uh, ultramafic rocks from three locations, and uh, I will present some brief characteristic of these three uh, types of rocks. So uh, we have uh, two partially serpentinized peridotites. Uh, 
uh, from site one, which is a former nickel mine, and uh, from active magnesite mine. And uh, the third rock is a proper serpentinite uh, without any relics of uh, primary minerals, primary olivine, or even, uh, yeah. Primary minerals, yeah. So no olivine in this uh, rock. Uh, so here uh, there is a more detailed description of the of the materials, and once again, um, uh, rocks from uh, site one and three are very similar in terms of uh, phase composition. And uh, this rock uh, from site two, serpentine. Serpentinite, it's completely different, uh, composed almost exclusively of serpentine group minerals up to uh, 95%. So this, uh, these are the results of um, X-ray diffraction, Rittfeld refinement uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, of course, in the context, uh, in the context of the of this research, of the purpose of this research, uh, it's worth mentioning about chemical composition of the studied rocks, especially uh, the concentrations of nickel, cobalt, and chromium. And as we can see, the, the concentrations of nickel, uh, cobalt, and uh, chromium are uh, typical for uh, ultramafic rocks, I mean, uh, around 2,000 ppm of uh, nickel between uh, 2,000 and 3,000 uh, milligrams per kilo of chromium and around 100 uh, milligrams per kilo of cobalt in these rocks. Uh, what are the uh, uh, mineral, uh, which minerals are the main nickel, chromium and cobalt bearing phases? So these are for nickel, olivine, serpentine group minerals, spinel and sulfides. For chromium, uh, these are spinel and clinochlor. And for cobalt, uh, these, uh, the identified um, chromium uh, cobalt carriers are sulfides. Uh, so I will move on right now to discuss the experiments aimed uh, at uh, mineral carbonation of the studied ultramafic rocks. So our starting material was uh, rock powder with a, a fraction below 50 micrometers. Uh, the samples prepared in this way were put uh, into uh, reactors where experiments uh, were conducted uh, under uh, various conditions. In general, the uh, experiments uh, can be divided into short term uh, and uh, um, in short term the experiments, the samples were subjected to conditions uh, of uh, uh, lower uh, lower uh, temp. Sorry, excuse me. In short term experiments, uh, the samples were subjected uh, to conditions of uh, higher uh, temperatures and higher pressures. Uh, uh, and the long term experiments uh, uh, were supposed to mimic the natural carbonations of ultramafic rocks, and the sample were subjected uh, to lower temperatures and pressures, but for a, a longer uh, period, uh, time period. Uh, and the products uh, of the carbonation uh, process, the carbonation experiments, were then uh, subjected to uh, mineralogical analysis uh, and uh, mineral uh, composition was determined by uh, X-ray diffraction, powder diffraction, uh, and uh, uh, some uh, observations uh, using a scanning electron uh, microscope. And uh, today I will only discuss the results of the experiments that proved to be the most effective uh, in terms of the amount of uh, carbonates obtained by the uh, car mineral carbonation reaction. This was a 48-hour experiment. Uh, conducted at uh, 185 uh, degrees and 150 uh, bar pressure. And uh, X-ray uh, diffraction uh, patterns uh, for all samples uh, indicated uh, that uh, 
reaction of the starting material with carbon dioxide uh, resulted in formation of magnesite. Uh, the amount of magnesite uh, varies uh, from sample to sample and for uh, peridotite for, uh, for, from uh, for the first peridotite uh, we uh, obtained uh, around 14 percent of magnesite uh, probably as a result of uh, olivine transformation because we see that the uh, amount of uh, forsterite decreases uh, uh, in this uh, comparing to the to the starting material in serpentinite uh, from site two in uh, proper serpentinite we uh, have similar amount of magnesite. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, around thirteen uh, percent, uh, and uh, this time it was probably formed uh, at the uh, as a result of uh, serpentine group minerals transformation. Uh, and what we what was uh, the most surprising for us, uh, and at the same time probably the most interesting, uh, the results of uh, experiment um, involving the the second uh, per, uh, serpentinized peridotite uh, from the third site. Uh, in this case, uh, the amount of magnesite uh, was the highest, and uh, quantitative analysis uh, based on Ritfeld refinement showed that we have about. 50% uh, of magnesite in the sample after uh, experiment. So we uh, tried to uh, think about this and uh, we tried to explain why uh, why such a difference between uh, rocks which are quite similar, I mean two serpentinite peridotites. Uh, so maybe because of differences in mineral composition, or maybe uh, because uh, some conditions of of formation of uh, of the starting material. So, for instance, uh, for site one, uh, we have a more stable mineral assemblage uh, at uh, experimental conditions because uh, uh, because of um, uh, metamorphism that uh, that. Uh, experience uh, the, these rocks or maybe because of presence of secondary uh, iron oxyhydroxides or silica uh, which uh, act uh, acted as a reaction inhibitors during this uh, mineral carbonation uh, reaction uh, okay and now i will present how the carbonation product uh, looks uh, look like uh, and uh, in the sample, uh, I will only present the results for the third, uh, for this uh, more attractive uh, material for uh, mineral carbonation. Uh, so the effects of uh, this carbonation are uh, seen uh, most clearly for this, uh, for this uh, peridotite. Uh, already for experiments uh, under relatively uh, mild uh, conditions uh, and the higher temperature and higher pressure uh, experiments have resulted in in the formation of magnesite uh, a kind of uh, uh, the magnesite uh, which forms a kind of binder that uh, binds uh, together the remaining uh, um, primary components uh, of uh, of the starting material. So you can see here quite uh, large crystals of uh, magnesite uh, acting as a binder for the other components of uh, of uh, of this material. So we are still waiting for the results of uh, uh, of chemical analysis um, of the solutions as, and samples after the uh, experiments. Uh, so we cannot yet draw the conclusions about the fate of metallic elements uh, during mineral carbonation. But uh, in the meantime, we decided to look at what is the pos potential uh, for binding metallic elements in natural carbonates, in natural uh, magnesites, uh, um, because quite a few of uh, these phases uh, are found in the third location. Uh, which is the magnesite query. Uh, and the bulk chemical analysis uh, of uh, naturally occurring uh, magnesite carbonates uh, 
show that uh, there are up to uh, several hundred milligrams per kilo of nickel in this uh, carbonates, up to 400 milligrams per kilo of zinc, and uh, up to uh, 150 uh, milligrams per kilo of uh, lead in um, this magnesite. Of, of course, it could uh, it varies from one sample to another, and we uh, analyzed uh, this uh, magnesite. This not only magnesite but uh, carbonites uh, uh, using uh, microbeam analysis uh, uh, by electron microprobe and laser ablation, uh, and uh, it showed that. Uh, there are quite significant contents of uh, metallic elements in, in magnesite, especially in uh, magnesite that we called uh, nodular magnesite, whereas in magnesite and dolomite from, uh, uh, from uh, magnesite dolomite veins, we do not uh, observe uh, uh, as much as in nodular magnesite, uh, we also observe quite important uh, concentrations in uh, cobalt for uh, for these uh, nodular magnesites. Mm. So let's move on uh, to the uh, to the um, to a summary of the this third part of uh, of my speech. Uh, so as I you before we still wait we are still waiting for the analysis of uh, fluid and solid products in terms of chemical composition but uh, what we uh, what we can say uh, already is that uh, these short short term experiments uh, conducted at temperatures above 180 and uh, higher pressures above 150 proved to be the most uh, effective and un what, what was unexpected that one peridotite was uh, more prone to carbonation than the other one and than the proper serpentinite. Uh, so explanation uh, most probably will be mineral composition, the condition of formation of, uh, of these rocks, uh, which were, uh, which uh, this condition conditions uh, kind of uh, prepared the, the rock from the third side for this uh, uh, mineral carbonation. Uh, and, uh, okay, natural materials may contain some uh, important amounts of uh, metallic elements. So uh, the open question is uh, whether it will be possible that by choosing the right conditions for the process of mineral carbonation, we will be able to, to bind the metallic elements in, in the products of, meter, of uh, mineral carbonation. It, uh, it would be uh, really a good, uh, good point, good thing. Uh, and uh, we are planning to uh, to investigate, of course, the stability of this uh, carbonation products. Uh, but what is, I think, the most important conclusion that we can draw from this uh, uh, this part is that uh, even small differences in the composition of the starting material can affect the efficiency of. Uh, carbonation, and uh, we can say that each sample, each peridotite requires an individual uh, approach uh, and, uh, and the experiment approach. Uh, okay, so um, the time has come to summarize my speech. Um, so I hope I have convinced you that uh, ultramafic rocks and associated soils are extremely interesting objects uh, for research. Uh, and I have only mentioned a, a small part of research uh, dedicated to ultramafic geosystems. However, we should remember that the possibilities and uh, perspectives, perspectives uh, for research are much wider uh, through, for example, the study of ultramafic rock, we can reconstruct the processes uh, acting and occurring in the Earth's mantle. Uh, the study of uh, ultramafic uh, rocks and weathering can also um, have an application uh, aspect, uh, applied aspect. 
because uh, because of deposits of critical elements uh, which are often associated with uh, with ultra mafic rocks uh, probably all of us uh, have had the opportunity to deal with uh, or to heard about uh, laterite uh, nickel deposits um, during my uh, uh, talk i try to show how important it is to study ultra mafic geosystems uh, in terms of metal mobility, uh, although I only mentioned the plants that, are, that uh, hyper accumulate uh, metals and grow in ultramafic areas, uh, it should be uh, underlined that this topic is uh, also of great interest to scientists. These plants can be used for phytoremediation or of contaminated sites or even for uh, phyto mining. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, despite despite uh, what I wanted to 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 repeat, is that uh, despite uh, many common features uh, such as nickel, chromium, and cobalt uh, concentrations uh, in ultramafic rocks, uh, these rocks uh, also have some differences, and this variability. Uh, affects uh, the behavior of metallic elements during weathering, as I uh, tried to show you today, and of uh, it affects also the susceptibility uh, to mineral carbonation processes. So uh, this is the key to 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 solve the, the research uh, problems of so the mineralogy. Yeah. And so that's all. And uh, in the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-workers, my uh, PhD students, uh, my colleagues, and uh, of course, my mm, colleagues who accepted me uh, at uh, the laboratory uh, laboratories who, who, where I uh, had uh, the opportunity to work. So I hope I didn't forget some somebody, but here are the people mostly involved in this uh, ultramafic part of my research activity. So thank you all. And uh, once again, thank uh, to the medal committee uh, for awarding me and uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you um, some of my uh, research activities. Thanks. Thank you, Jakub, for this very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I think you nicely highlighted uh, how uh, research in mineralogy and your results, how they addressed some important uh, concerns of our modern societies, uh, citizens, of course, uh, want to be sure to live in a safe environment, whether it comes to the, the quality of the water and the soils where plants are grown. Uh, or, or, or when it, we come to uh, the issue of the global warming and how uh, carbon uh, capture and, uh, and storage through uh, carbonation uh, is the uh, way to help us uh, generally and uh, what are the, how it could help in storing the, the carbon, what are the, the threads and the opportunities there. So thank you very much uh, for, for this. It was very, very, very nice. Um, we have uh, uh, a few minutes uh, to take uh, questions. Uh, do we have uh, questions in the audience? Uh, Albert uh, raised, uh, Dot Gill raised his hand. So, Albert, if you yes. want. Jacob, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question to your first project where you looked at bioavailability in, in soils. Did you look at the clay mineralogy of your different soils developed on peridotites, serpentinites, and intermediate rocks? Do you see any difference in clay mineralogy and clay content? And if that is related to your nickel and chromium uh, behavior? Uh, yes, I, I did look, uh, but uh, yeah, I did not present uh, this, this, uh, this uh, results. But mostly the, the most important clay mineral formed uh, as a result of weathering of uh, these ultramafic rocks were smectite or smectite uh, related phases. And there were some, uh, some relationships between uh, clay content and mobility of, uh, of uh, these three 
uh, elements, especially nickel. So yeah, but generally uh, it was um, not uh, much of differences between, uh, for instance, uh, site one and site four, which I compared for the um, co um, concentrations of metallic elements. There were some differences, uh, but I think caused by different uh, topography or different, you know, uh, draining drainage conditions. Uh, but generally, the, the most important uh, secondary clay mineral was smegtite. And do, do, uh, do, do they contain nickel and chromium? This mm -hmm. yes, nickel, no, not chromium. Nickel I measured using a micro probe in the fraction below two micrometers, but uh, no chromium inside. Uh, for chromium was the, the chloride, uh, clinochlor containing uh, quite important uh, proportions of, uh, of, of, chrom of chromium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Manuel Menzel. Would, Manuel, would you like to ask the question? Or if not, I will uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was wondering about the carbonation experiments. Um, the 150 bar pressure is that the partial pressure of CO2 or a confining pressure? And sure, but I, I I cannot hear. There is a echo. Uh, Manuel is asking whether uh, the CO2 pressure is the total pressure or the partial pressure in your in your high pressure uh, in your uh, hydrothermal experiments. If it's a CO2 partial pressure or a confining pressure. And my, the more important question is if you added alkalinity. The, the, these uh, batch reactors were uh, were uh, put into the into the oven. So and we we tried to uh, to keep this uh, this uh, pressure of 150 bars. Uh, yeah, thank you. So probably you can exchange by email uh, okay, later yeah. together. Um, uh, do we have another question? Uh, if if not, I, I do have a, 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 another one. So you mentioned um, in some of the slides uh, some 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 crops that have been grown on uh, on ultramafic soil in over probably a, a, a long time now. Um, is there a, a survey of the, the population in terms of uh, health issues that could be related to the, 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 the content, the nickel and, and mostly the chromium content of those uh, soils? No, like there, there is you're, not. You're following, uh, with there is colleagues. not, uh, because generally there is not, uh, not a lot of uh, ultramafic sites in, in Poland. And uh, uh, I think only in two places uh, people are trying to uh, to cultivate uh, uh, plants, but uh, I didn't hear about the, the, any survey uh, of uh, of uh, people and the health issues. Uh, but what I've heard uh, and I saw that uh, people are trying to produce uh, fertilizers from uh, uh, crushed and milled serpentinites. So um, it's. Uh, in my opinion, it's not a good point, but yeah. It's probably not a good idea indeed. But there is a research paper that uh, say that uh, it's not uh, that bad for the environment because there is not a lot of nickel inside. So. Yeah, but there is no survey such as uh, in New Caledonia, for example, uh, where people are monitoring uh, the, the, the concentrations of nickel in, in hair or in urine, I think. Yeah. Okay. Maybe because it's not a big problem; it's only a local. I think it's it's good news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. You 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 worked a lot about the concentration of uh, of nickel and uh, and cobalt, uh, in the different uh, plants, and uh, and of course most of them most of the hyper accumulating uh, ones they are uh, nickel accumulating ones, so. I was wondering if there are some others for chromium, for instance, because as we all know, so chromium can be, uh, when it's hexavalent, it's uh, highly carcinogenic and uh, 
is is a real issue. So, is there uh, do you have some evidence from all the work that you've done of some uh, uh, chromium yeah, I'm, hyperaccumulating? I'm not, I'm not really a specialist uh, of plants, <laughs> and uh, I actually I don't I do not remember. I know that uh, in Poland we don't even have uh, any hyperaccumulator hyperaccumulator for nickel and for chromium is for sure that we do not have uh, i'm not sure i i should ask my former phd student for that but he's not present because he has a teaching to do but uh, uh, i don't remember whether they are chromium hyper hyper accumulators Sorry, right. and I probably I probably have a, a more general question to probably to to finish. So, um, you're the, an expert of uh, ultramafic uh, rocks and soils. Uh, so, talking these days about uh, uh, the energy uh, transition, uh, do you see those uh, rocks as a as an as an asset or as a thread? Even the support the well the issue with the serpentine minerals. Uh, in terms of these transition periods for our society, so that will be my final question. <laughs> it's hard to to answer. <laughs> yeah, I know well. that there are some pilot installations for this uh, CO two uh, CO two management, I would say, uh, but I'm not sure if it works. Uh, there are some installations that are working in Iceland uh, and the people uh, trying to put the CO2 in the into the mafic rocks, not uh, ultra mafic, but mafic, and it, it uh, seems to be working. Uh, there are some uh, pilot uh, installations uh, in Oman, uh, so probably, yeah, but uh, I would like to know uh, what is happening with these metallic elements? Yeah, so okay. that's why I, I'm interested in it. I, I don't think it's really a threat, but we should be careful and to manage uh, properly this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jakub. So as we are getting uh, close to the end, I would uh, uh, encourage the the audience uh, to join me and upload. Uh, Jakub for this uh, very nice uh, presentation and uh, uh, again congratulations for winning uh, the 22, uh, 2022 uh, medal uh, for research excellence of the of the EMU. Thank you very much uh, Jakub and that said I think it's uh, it's time for us uh, to close this uh, session so take care and um, See you next year with the for the next uh, presentation, and I hope to see most of you at the uh, EMC meeting in in Dublin uh, next uh, summer. So that's it. So bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.